We are continuing our series, Drawing the Battle Lines. So we have uh, just begun this series, and our goal is to try to understand a biblical point of view when it comes to things like spiritual warfare. Remember, last week we decided, we discussed the fact that spiritual warfare is an ongoing conflict between God and Satan. This conflict is all about God's glory. God has it, Satan wants it. So there's this conflict that goes on. And this conflict is not directly between us and Satan, although we are certainly put into it. Right? We can look around at our lives and other people who are living and we see this conflict that they're going through. It's not about us, but we are very much involved in it. And this morning, we're going to begin a, a, in a new series of the next one We're going to look for the next three or so weeks at our enemy. We need to know who our enemy is. And this morning, we begin by asking the question, who is Satan? Now, you may have some names that you'd like to throw out as potential Satan's, but let me assure you, they are not. This conflict is all about God and Satan. We get stuck in the middle, and it is important that we know who we're dealing with. There was a general by the name of Sun Tzu. He was a Chinese general several thousand years ago who wrote a book called the, Al the Art of War. Now this book has been paraphrased and taken in so many different directions. I read it specifically as it applied to business. I've seen it applied to sports. I've seen it applied to many different things. But his goal, his general's goal, was to take all of his uh, winning strategies. He was a very successful general. He expanded the empire greatly. His goal was to take this book and and give it to his predecessors and his, uh, the guys who worked for him so that they would be victorious as well. One of the principles in his writing was no more enemies. Well, let me tell you something. As good as that is, that's not man's creation. That is God's creation. That is a biblical thing. If we were to look at, and we will look at later, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says this, Be silver-minded, be watchful, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he can devour. <coughs> That's perhaps the most apt description of our enemy. And Peter says, listen, believers, you need to be aware. Be sober-minded. Pay attention. Know your enemy. And that's what we're going to do over the next three weeks or so. What better way to begin He's studying on Satan and deciding or, or looking at his original state, his creation. Now, I want to preface this by saying this topic can be a little bit confusing. There's no one chapter that we can go to. There's not a passage in the Bible that we can say, this is what tells us how Satan was created, where he came from, when he was created. There's no nice little neat tidy package. So what we have to do is look throughout Scripture. And we have to see where we can find passages that speak specifically to them. And that's what we're going to try to do today. So I want you to take your Bible. And I want you to go to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 28. If you're using the Pew Bible, it's on page 451, 452 is where we're going to be. Ezekiel chapter 28. We're going to actually be in a lot of passages. If you've taken a look at the notes on the back of the bulletin, You'll see two things. There's a lot of references and there's a lot of blanks. I knew it was going to be hot and muggy today, so I'm doing my best to help you stay awake and stay with me. So Ezekiel chapter 28 is where we're going to be. And we're going to learn some things about Satan in this passage. But before we talk about how he was created, let's talk first of all about whether or not he exists. How many by a raise of hand would say Satan exists? Good. We won't have to spend too much time on this. This is good. I appreciate that. It's a lot easier to say that he exists than to prove or to see how he was created, isn't it? We can look throughout the Bible and we see passage after passage that deals with Satan. Let me give you a couple of those today. We know that he exists because Jesus faced Satan throughout his ministry. He was involved in casting out demons. 
He was involved in spiritual battles. The one in particular that we're going to spend some time in a few weeks looking at was when Jesus was confronted by Satan himself. We have that recorded for us in Matthew 4 and Luke 4. That temptation of Christ. We know Satan exists because Jesus faced him. Jesus also taught about Satan quite a bit. He faced him one on one and through his disciples. And he taught him. Two great examples are found in Matthew chapter 13. In verses 1 to 23, we have what's called the parable of the sower. And in this parable, Jesus is saying, look, the word of God is like a seed, and it's cast out on different types of soil. And he's speaking with one of those types in verse 19 when he says this, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom or the gospel and does not understand it, the evil one, you see the man is in the Satan, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. Satan wants nothing to do with you hearing the gospel. That is exactly what he wants to avoid as much as possible. And so when he can, he will come and he will snatch that away. The last part of Matthew chapter 13 has a parable called the parable of the weeds. In this parable, Jesus is talking about how weeds are sown among the good seeds. And in verse 39, he says, There's an enemy who sowed the seed. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. So it's listed very clearly. Jesus taught a lot about Satan, and his apostles carried on that same tradition. Remember in Acts chapter 5, Peter and the leaders of the church are there, and there was a great need in Jerusalem in the believers. And so th they're doing was going out and selling pieces of property. They were selling the extra things that they had, and they would bring that money into the church to help the poor. In this case, a couple by the name of Ananias and Sapphira. They decided they were going to sell their piece of land, but they didn't want to give everything to the church. Understand, there was no biblical command that you had to go and sell what you had and give to the church. This was a free will offering. But Ananias and Sapphira wanted that nice, warm, fuzzy feeling when everybody goes, Oh, you sold it for that much and you gave it all to the church? You are so good. Here, sit in the back pew where you want to sit. They may have been bad, but you don't know that. So Ananias and Sapphira come to the church and they say, We sold this land for $100,000. And here it is. In reality, they sold it for much more than that. And they lied. And Peter looked at Ananias and he said, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Peter knew that Satan was real. And he was dealing with him. We can look at Ephesians. We looked at one verse last week in Ephesians chapter 2. You were dead in the trespasses of your sins in, what, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. Remember, we mentioned just really briefly, that is a title for Satan. It gives us just a little bit of insight into his rule. He is in charge of this world at this time. He is the prince of this world. We go a little farther in Ephesians chapter 4. And if you want to... You want to memorize an important passage of Scripture? Go and memorize Ephesians chapter 4. If you do any counseling or discipleship with me, you will memorize Ephesians chapter 4 at one point or another. This whole section especially is talking about put off these worldly, sinful characteristics like stealing and lying and put on these godly characteristics like a good work ethic, speaking the truth, speaking kindness, in Ephesians 4, we'll go back to verse 26 for the context. It says this, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And then verse 27, Give no opportunity to the devil. Again, 1 Peter 5, 8, we've looked at that. Your adversary, the devil, that a roaring lion, is going around looking to eat you up in such a way. We know that the devil is real. If we believe that the Bible is God's word, if we believe 100% without any problems that the Bible is God's word, we must believe that Satan exists. It's in there. We simply have to believe it. So we know he exists, which means one of two things. Either he has always existed, in other words, he's like God, 
or he was created at some point. Now, I'm going to give you the answer. He was created. We know that he was created. Colossians 1, 16 and 17, for by him, not Satan, but through Jesus, through God, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible or invisible, whether thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Guess what that word all means in the original Greek language? All. Yeah, you guys are scuffers. This is great. All things, whether it's in heaven, angels, or on earth, ice cream. It's possible. All things were created by God for God's glory. We know this. Now when we talk about creation of anything, we love to go to Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 because that is the creation account. We're having a great time in our Sunday school class in the morning studying through Genesis 1, Genesis 2. Eventually, I think we'll get out of Genesis 1 2. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. There's a lot there. But we want to learn about creation. We go there. If you look at Genesis 1 and 2, do you see Satan mentioned in there specifically anywhere? No. He's not referenced in Genesis 1 and 2, but we know he's created because of Colossians 1 16. So when? When was Satan created? Well, thankfully, again, there's no one text, but there are verses throughout Scripture that we can go to. We can go to the Psalms, or we can go to this passage in Job. Job 38, verses 4 through 7, gives us a hint as to when the angels were created. Read it with me, or listen as I read it. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Give you the context of this passage. In the book of Job, Job has already had his three really good friends, and then the fourth one show up and, and really kind of chew him out. Because he is obviously some kind of horrible sinner for having to deal with all of the things that he's had to do. And Job kind of stands up and defends himself. And the, the chapters leading up is it's a whole lot of, if I've done something wrong, if I sinned in any way, then I would deserve these things, but I have not. And then he says, where is God that I can present my case to him? Be careful what you wish for. Because God showed up. And God is speaking to Job, and in a sense, I'll paraphrase this, Job, you are not God. You are a man. And then he asks him this question, where were you? I remember creation, Job. I was there. I didn't see you. You weren't, you know, handing me tools or helping me. You weren't there. But somebody was. Verse 7, when the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Morning stars, sons of God. Those are phrases used throughout the Old Testament to reference angels. So, we don't know exactly when, but it's safe to say, before the foundations of the earth were created, the angels were there because they witnessed it. So if we were to go back to Genesis chapter 1 and look at verse 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, period. That is a factual statement. That is real. God created the heaven and the earth. End of story. Thankfully God goes on. And in verse 2 and following, He gives us the account. He gives us the details of how things were created. And we know that according to Job, the angels were there when the foundations of the earth were laid. So we know roughly when he was created, probably before the first or the second day of creation. Now, we know Satan exists. We know that he was created. Did you realize that Satan had a very important role in creation? Not in doing creation, but after creation, he had responsibility. He was a very important angel. It's kind of hard for us to fathom because we see Satan and we think of him as nothing more than an enemy. Look at our passage here in Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28, let's look at verse 11 to see what this passage has to say about Satan himself. 
Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, raise the lamentation over the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You are the signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You are in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, sardis, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, emerald, and carbuncle. Crafted in gold for your settings and your graves. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. You were an anointed guardian chariot. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God. In the midst of the stones of fire you walked. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created. Let's stop right here. Remember I said this passage was about Satan. You see his name mentioned anywhere? No. In fact, you see someone else mentioned. King of Tyre. Tyre is a real city that actually had expanded into quite an empire at this time in history. It can be very difficult to understand these prophecies sometimes if you look at it without realizing that sometimes prophecies have multiple uh, people or nations that it's targeted against. Many times you read a prophecy and it says, You, nation of Babylon, this is what's going to happen to you. And it's very straightforward. And that's what applies to you. But in this prophecy, and one that we'll look at briefly in Isaiah, we see that there are actually two intended targets. If we go back to verse 1 and verse 2 of this chapter, we see that Ezekiel is bringing up a lamentation against the prince of Tyre. We know that this was a man because if we look at verse 2, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, thus says the Lord God, because your heart is proud, and you have said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of the gods, in the heart of the seas, and here's the important phrase, that you are but a man, and no God. Ezekiel is dealing with the prince of Tyre in this first part, but then he moves into the king of Tyre. And I will tell you today that this king of Tyre isn't the ruler, but it's the power behind the ruler. Ezekiel's prophesying against this prince, this man who had done horrible things. And he had set himself up as a God, and God said, no. And then he deals with Satan. And it's in this passage that we learn a little bit more about who Satan was there in the early creation. So you have to kind of understand there's two targets in this passage. Now, let's get back to Satan. First of all, we see that he was an angel. Verse 14 says, an anointed cherub. When you think of cherubs, this is this kind of the picture you think of that you see up on the screen. A naked baby with wings flying around. Now, if you're younger, you probably don't think of these great paintings. You think more of the Jonas Brothers in Night at the Museum 2. Some of you get that. Okay. The Bible tells us very clearly that Satan was an angel, an anointed cherub. We'll get to that a little bit more. It also says in verse 15 that he was holy. Have you ever thought of Satan at, ever, at any time being perfect and sinless and blameless? Verse 15, you were blameless in your ways from the day you were created. We also see that he was given a very important rank. In verse 14, you see that word cherub. Cherubs played a very important part in heaven and in history. That song that we sang, the Revelation song, that is taken from Revelation chapter 4 and a couple other places where the living creatures are standing around the very throne of God and singing, worthy is a lamb that was slain. Holy, holy is he. <laughs> that phrase, living creatures, is the same phrase of the cherubs. That is who it's speaking of. The cherubs were very important in the Garden of Eden. Tail end of Genesis chapter 3. When Adam and Eve sinned, and God said, No, you have to leave the garden. God placed a cherub there at the entrance to protect the tree of life. In the book of Exodus, you see how the, uh, the temple is required, the, the blueprint for the temple and for the Ark of the Covenant. And on top of the Ark, if you've seen Indiana Jones, you know there's two angels. Their cherubs positioned on top with their wings outspread, protecting the ark. 
in the temple itself. The walls had cherubim carved into the walls. The tapestries, they were woven into them. Whenever we see God's presence, we see cherubs. Ezekiel chapter 1. You want to read a passage this afternoon that's going to kind of blow your mind? Read Ezekiel chapter 1. It gives a description of these living creatures, the cherubs, and it is so hard to comprehend. Four faces and multiple wings, and, and it's, the bottom line is, Ezekiel is describing something that is indescribable. These cherubs are so beautiful and so powerful, and they are always linked with God's presence. So when you think of cherubs, you have to think of God. Satan was an anointed cherub. He was responsible and part of the, the worship of God right there in His very presence. I'd also like to point out that it's very likely that He performed a priestly role. Look at verses 13 and 14 again. It says, You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. Sardis, topaz, diamond, barrel, onyx, and the list goes on. That list of stones is said to be in a covering. Don't think of a roof or a blanket when you think, see that we're covering. Think of a dress plate. It's protection. Those stones are also in another dress plate mentioned in Exodus chapter 28 that the high priest of Israel wore. Those nine stones and three more, which total 12 represented the 12 tribes of Israel. Satan is described as, as being covered or protected by this breastplate, which became the uniform, if you will, of the high priest. Second reason why I believe Satan was given a priestly role, uh, uh, very involved with the worship of Christ, is in verse 14, the word anointed cherub. Who was anointed in Israel? Well, kings were anointed. And priests. The high priest was anointed. The purpose <coughs> to signify to everyone that this individual had a very important role. This individual had great rank and an important job in a priestly or a kingly fashion. You keep going through verse 14, it says this, I place you, you were on the holy mountain of God, in the midst of a stone of fires you walked. That holy mountain of God is referenced elsewhere as Again, the presence of God. When I first really kind of dug into this, I thought, no, Satan? As a priest? As one who's involved intimately in leading other people to worship God? Whew. It's crazy. But as we read through this, I think, I think it's very possible. Satan was a created angel who was very beautiful and very wise, very powerful, very important. And he was there in the very physical presence of God. And when we look at that, we think, how in the world can anyone walk away from that? I mean, to be there with God, to be one of, of the leaders in the worship of the Almighty, and all of a sudden get something in our minds like, hey, that could be me. We see that Satan made a choice. He made a choice. Not to lead others to worship God, but to seek others to worship Him. Verse 15, Ezekiel 28, verse 15. We read half of that. But let's read the whole verse about you were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found. In the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence in your midst, and you sinned. So I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O guardian cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Verse 17, your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I exposed you for kings to feast their eyes on you. Satan took a lot of pride in his beauty, his splendor. His heart was proud because of it. And instead of directing people to worship the Almighty God, he started to covet that worship for himself. Flip back just a few books to the book of Isaiah. 
Isaiah chapter 14. We use the Pew Bible, it's on page 365. Isaiah chapter 14 gives us a little more insight into his thought process, his mind. Isaiah chapter 14, page 365. Again, this is like the Ezekiel passage. There's multiple levels of interpretation. There's multiple points to this. Isaiah 14, let's look at verse 12. How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. Let's just stop there. Because some of your versions probably have the word Lucifer right there. Understand, Lucifer is a Latin word which simply means morning star, day star, which was the planet Venus. Okay? It became <laughs> synonymous with Satan. Many would like to, to think that that was his name before he fell. Regardless, this passage is talking about Babylon, but it's also talking about Satan. Verse 12, how you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. In verse 13, we see some statements that show us how much pride he had in his plans. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. Above the stars of God, I will set my throne on high. I will sit on a mountain assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. <laughs> We see a very real, very large ego problem here, don't we? Satan, leading other people to worship God, says, No, I want that glory. I want the glory that God has for myself. <coughs> and so begins the conflict of the ages. Satan was no longer allowed to lead in worship or to worship their throne. He was cast out. He left his original, his created state, and he became our enemy, our adversary that we deal with today. Now, I could end right here, but I don't want to because it's kind of, well, perhaps a little fearful. Satan, who is this great and powerful being, is now running loose here on earth. Let me give you some insights into his destiny. We mentioned this just a little bit last week, but I want to make sure that we understand that Satan is defeated. We talked last week about Christ on the cross, and he says, it is finished, and what he meant. In Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 through 10, let me just read this. When the thousand years are ended, this is speaking of the end times, Satan will be released from his prison, will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea, and they marched up over the broad plain of the earth, surrounding the camp of the saints, and the beloved city, the fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And verse 10, and the devil, who had deceived them, was thrown into the lake of fire, sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night, forever and ever. This passage makes it very clear. God wins, Satan loses. <laughs> And as long as you are a believer in Christ, as long as you have accepted Him as your personal Savior, you are on the winning side. Are we going to face some battles and skirmishes in this life? Yes, we absolutely are. But know this, ultimately, Satan is defeated. And as we close this morning, I want to give you just a couple of questions to help you kind of judge where you are at in your view of Satan. Remember, last week I mentioned that we can err in two different directions when it comes to Satan, when it comes to spiritual battles. We can err on that side of, of uh, overemphasizing, of making Satan much bigger than he is. Every little thing that goes wrong is because of him. <coughs> or we can go to the opposite extreme. Well, we don't believe in Satan at all. Or he certainly doesn't work here. He works over in Africa. We've got science and we've got technology and that helps us we're okay. Those two extremes are wrong. One is a big view of Satan, and one is a small view of Satan. And we need a balanced view of Satan. So very quickly, let me give you just a couple of things to help you see. Your view of Satan is too small if you see Satan as nothing more than a symbol of evil. We're all familiar with the boogeyman, right? One of my favorite songs, God is bigger than the boogeyman. Veggie tales, Rob. <coughs> 
Satan is not just some concept that man created in order to get kids to stay in bed to and stop asking for water. Satan is real. If we think he is just some made up figure, then we have a very small view of him. If you think he was something for, you know, Bible times, back when they didn't have microscopes to find the germs that were causing all the problems, then your view is too small. If you don't think he's capable of performing miracles, great feats of power, of changing this world, your view is very small. Satan is very powerful. And lastly, if you think you can defeat him in your own power, you are mistaken. Satan is not someone that we should just toy around with. So many people that have been involved in witchcraft and worshiping Satan, literally, always come back to the fact, well, I had power. And I felt like I was in control. And that's just not the case. These are ideas. If, if you have any of these ideas in your mind about Satan, it's too small. You're not giving him enough credit. But on the other extreme, do you see him as an evil god? Realize this, Satan is not the opposite of God. <laughs> that would be giving Satan too much power, too much authority. He is an angel. God is creator. Satan was created. They are not the same. They are not opposites. He is not an evil God. He is not equal to God. There is a huge difference. And as we go through the next couple of weeks, we will see some things. And I think you might be challenged in your perception of what Satan can and cannot do. Here's the big one. If you live in fear, you avoid learning about Satan, you avoid talking about him because you're afraid you're going to give him power or control, you're giving him too much power. You're giving him too much control. God is in control. God has defeated Satan already. The battle is over. It's just a matter of standing firm in his last day. I'm sure we're going to have a lot of questions that are going to come up. But let me encourage you. Be a part of our morning services if you want to learn more. Sunday nights, we want to do greater depth as we talk about this as well. Most important, if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you are on the losing side. That's something that you need to deal with. And I'm going to ask the praise team to come up and and we're going to sing that Revelation song one more time as they do. Uh, but if you're here today and you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, don't walk out of here thinking you've got this under control. There's always time. You never know what this world brings. It's so important that we make the decision to be with God today. We need to draw the battle lines because you want the already been drawn. Satan is already attacking us and desiring to do nothing more than prevent us from coming to a saving knowledge of Christ. If you're in that position today, I'm just going to be right up here. You're more than welcome to come up and talk to me. See me after the service. This is life and death <laughs> that we're talking about. Let's pray. God, I thank you for just the opportunity to be here this morning. Lord, I thank you for your word. That we can know our enemy. That we can see who it is that we are fighting against. But God, I thank you so much that you have said, it is finished. The victory is won. The battle is over. And Lord, help us to stand firm. As we close this time this morning, just worshiping you, just praising your name as those living creatures, those cherubs do in Revelation. God, help it to be real for us. And we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Would you stand and sing this?
great God. Again, I admit that I am so weak. You are so strong. I am so flawed, and you are so perfect. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending your son to die for me on that cross so that I can have the right relationship with you that I need, that you desire. And again, Lord, I just ask that if there's anyone here today who hasn't made that decision, that today would be the day that they could stand and join with us and really say, honor, empower, worthy is the way. Oh, Lord, help us. Be with us today as we go out, Lord. Help us to be aware of your presence in our life. Help us, Lord, to stand firm in your strength as we go through this day. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.